Good morning, everybody, and I apologize today if my voice is in rough shape. Woke up with a sore throat and coughing, so I'm going to try to suppress that during our chat today. Um, I want to make sure, I'm going to give some folks a little time to kind of join us today. If the audio is okay, give me a thumbs up or pound that like button. I just want to make sure I'm hearing some echo, but I've been hearing it lately and things have been fine. So let's see. Here we go. All right, so I see Machiavelli's with us. Thanks for joining us, Machiavelli. Um, let me just get a few things organized here. Got a few folks joining us. I'm going to give a few people some time just to kind of pop on in. I appreciate you guys hanging out with me this morning. Um, this is a topic, honestly, I think is one that uh, we all could benefit from. I know I wish I would have had this topic earlier in my training just because... Um, I didn't really see the big picture of uh, clinical care beyond the technique and the technical side. And this uh, um, topic today will actually touch a lot on that. Rika, all the way from Finland. Good to see you. So I'm going to give folks about a minute more, and then we'll start diving in a little bit and uh, talk about kind of our topic for today, which is going to be normative versus narrative-based communication. So that's something that I didn't even understand the difference. I didn't even really study my communication back in PT school. It was just the the normative size of, or normative style of communication. Um, I'm seeing for some reason the stream quality. Let me, give me one second. I'm going to plug this thing in hardwire to the ethernet so we're good to go. So pardon me for one second. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Thursday. I know over there in Finland, Rika, you guys are probably towards the afternoon here in Phoenix, 7 o'clock. Um, all right, so what really stirred this discussion um, is people in pain that um, when I work with them clinically, that standard way of communicating where I was just going to talk and question their tissues and symptom behaviors. I'm not saying that's wrong. That's definitely a part of what we should be doing as clinicians, but that really missed this human who was crying or angry or really struggling and uh, struggling to cope with what they were dealing with. I think that normative style of communication that we all have where we're discussing, you know, basically normative in the fact that we're trying to come to a treatment threshold. So we all get trained with differential diagnostics where we're trying to question symptom behavior and things to think maybe it's a maybe you're MDT trained and you're looking to see maybe it's a, a what they call a derangement or something that's something that might be or you're trying to question out to see if there's a directional preference present with your patient or uh, maybe your Maitland uh, trained therapist which I've been reared in both um, where you're trying to find like comparable signs and different uh, functional asterisk signs that you can kind of use as as markers of progress in your patient care all good things but when we read research and we look at qualitative studies, just like the ones that like Rika did on the um, uh, folks in the chronic pain program over in Finland, where they looked at uh, autonomic agency and different things like that, where folks don't feel like they have control and they feel like um, their perception of healthcare is different than what we think their perception of healthcare is. So um, the one book that really I think should be on your uh, bookshelf is this guy right here by John Lorner, Narrative Based practice in health and social care. Um, that's a great book. And it's one that I think can help open up your eyes to how do you understand the narrative or the story? Because that's how we communicate with each other. We tell stories, we tell narratives. That's kind of how we express ourselves and, and our feelings and our emotions and different things. Yet as healthcare professionals, we still have this kind of cordoned off narrative or normative based way of communicating with folks. Uh, Keith Meldrum, Theo, Joseph, Ray, nice to see you guys. Um, so the John Lorner is probably one of the preeminent figures. We actually had him on our podcast back, oh gosh, a couple, probably a month or so ago. Um, and he came on, he was actually author of this book. But really, he's leading the way as far as some of the, he's a primary care physician, I believe, who's really incorporated this into his practice and really thinks that this is something that isn't a barrier with time or reimbursement, that you should be able to listen to the human story that fits uh, that comes in with all the conditions that you treat. There's a human side to all the treatments you have, all the conditions you see. Um, and gosh, with the qualitative research and some of the psychosocial 
factors and different things that we see have a powerful influence on the patient's recovery. Sure makes sense that we should get better at eliciting that narrative and giving it space. You know, uh, John Quintner, Milton Cohen, uh, my f- buddy Matt Lowe has also kind of expounded on this kind of third space where there's intersubjective space where we create treatment encounters where we give a stage for that patient's story to come through. And we know that the research tells us that 18 seconds, 12 seconds, we're interrupting patients. Patients rarely get to finish their opening statements when they see us. Um, and we wonder why they get lost in healthcare because the humanity gets lost. The, the ability for them to express the suffering and the illness experience um, that they're having and some of the difficulties that they're having with coping, maybe it's family, maybe it's work, maybe it's a lot of things. I just worked with somebody uh, yesterday who's got a amazingly challenging situation. She's a single, you know, basically a single parent at this point with a very special needs kiddo. Um, ever since he's been born, it's been a massively stressful thing. She's done an amazing job as, a, as pr- basically a single parent to take care of this kiddo who's got, uh, you know, a litany of medical issues, um, really doesn't have much social support. Um, yet when we go to, when she seeks medical care for this widespread pain syndrome, she's sleeping two to three hours a day. Um, and there's just a bunch of horrible things going on, you know, as far as how she's having to deal and struggling to kind of cope with things. Yet we're MRIing her and telling her she's got to lose weight, which is frustrated the heck out of me but um so yeah let's talk a little bit about narrative-based practice a little bit i'm going to go through a little bit of some of what we talk about in our coursework let me bring that up um narrative-based practice and a lot of this comes directly from john's book um a lot of this is just direct quotes just because i think they're powerful quotes and john puts it eloquently um so let's look at this book a little bit but if you look at how we interact with patients traditionally you're always going to see this struggle and honestly I didn't think it struggled for me earlier in my career I was very much stuck in the normative style as far as I need to question to see it's a facet dysfunction or is it a disc dysfunction or what tissues are there AJ Jay Meyerson Samad PT good to see you guys um so yeah I I think early in my career and I think how we're trained as PTs I don't and maybe I'm wrong and if you guys had programs that really got you into this communication or soft skills which I hate that term you know, kudos to you guys, and you're lucky. I don't feel like I really was prepared, and I don't think it was nothing to speak poorly upon my program. I just don't think we recognized at that time how important the story and the narrative was for our patients. So, oh, I apologize. Now I'm just hearing my landscapers are coming and doing work. So if this, if you hear any noise in the background, that is what's going on. Um, so anyway, yes, the the narrative style is something that can kind of be the struggle. How do you kind of weave in and out? And you see the people who are masters of it, like. I would say Peter O'Sullivan's very good at it so he can question, but then say not only what's happening in your body, but what's happening in your head. So what's happening with, you know, your thoughts, your beliefs, what's worrying you about what's going on with this condition. So you're understanding kind of, you know, the unique narrative that that patient has. Um, and then while cl- our patients want to express the uniqueness of their experience, our professionals try to do us as professionals try to do the opposite. We try to kind of narrow it down to this differential diagnostic path, which again, isn't wrong, but when we get so focused on the normative based style of communication, we use we lose that humanity side, which, again, if you look at the research, it sure would make sense that we need to be respectful of that story because those psychosocial factors and difficulties of coping and all these things that we see that can often be parts of our patient's narrative get lost. And then that's where these people who never get a chance to express their story or their unique ex- illness experience can happen. Um, but John's book, points out beautifully and I'll link it in the comments that there is a possibility where we can follow that client's cues or that patient's cues in a way that allows them to fully fully express their stories and lead to better decision making that's more of a shared decision making more that third space where we're actually (coughs) excuse me respecting that patient's narrative allowing it to have a stage allowing the patient to feel listened to allowing the patient to feel validated so, I mean, amazingly powerful stuff. And this book is an easy read, by the way. You should, it's not a hard read. It's, it's relatively uh, short. I think I read it in a plane ride um, over uh, on vacation. So definitely worth your time to take a look at it. So if you look, just an example I wanted to put out there as far as kind of normative versus narrative. So, uh, you know, I'm your f- physical th- therapist who's going to be working with you on your knee pains. You know, great, they've really been bothering me. And then the therapist, we all kind of, did you have an injury? No, it just started out of the blue, you know, and then maybe the normative style communication. Okay, well, let's just look at, you know, the range of motion and different things. And have you had any popping crepitus or all the questions that, you know, we tend to norm, you know, have some normative stuff. And then the narrative therapist might, you know, and you can weave between these. Again, it's not to say we have to cordon ourselves off into one or the other. You shouldn't. 
um, the normative series, well, what's been, what was going on around your life around that time? And you might find, oh, it was just, you know, really stressful. I was in the process of moving across country and, and really was doing a lot of, uh, you know, lifting, bending, carrying, or man, I was right around the time. Um, I, I think I've talked about this in this uh, page before, but I've had numerous patients with arthritic joints where, and they had a clinic, they had radiographic findings, but all of a sudden they start hurting when they had this traumatic stressor, you know, death of a loved one or different things where all of a sudden I think that body's coping strategies and buffer to tolerate maybe some of the things those joints were um, communicating into the nervous system was kind of reduced. But, and then again, you, you listen to the client and let them have that ability to have that story, but then you can weave in some normative communication within that narrative based communication. It's not again, like you have to completely, and that's, I think the straw man argument that gets erected around like doing a lot of the soft skill stuff is like, you're just talking to patients and listening. No, you still be, are doing a very good normative style of communication where you're differentially diagnosing, questioning, is it locking, is it swelling, you know, are we doing things, are we seeing things that might think that there's a meniscus tear that's kind of the joints locked and blocked and not moving and they lost significant range of motion, they had a twisting injury or something that would make sense that it could be a meniscus issue. So again, it's, it's just recognizing that we have to stay away from just sticking to that left side of the column and then making sure we move over uh, to the right side with narrative-based communication. Joe Tata, nice to see you. Luke Davies, good to have you here. So again, amazingly powerful stuff when you start trying to understand the therapist or the client's narrative and story that surrounds their orthopedic condition. And I would say this is stuff that um, you have to look at, whether you work in acute care, sports injuries, uh, uh, chronic pain, inpatient rehab, and different things. Wherever, whatever condition you treat, there is a human story behind it, and I would encourage you to really think about it, listen to it, and give it a stage because it can really be an empowering thing for your patients and, most importantly, help you better understand that narrative. So some of the principles of this narrative-based practice, it's you're a conversational partner versus fixer. I think normative practice, we want to get to a treatment threshold where we can you know, traditionally maybe, and I think a lot of us aren't going into this fixer role, at least I hope so, where we're telling people, you know, we're questioning to find, you know, this tissue that we can identify and, you know, be a fixer of it. I think hopefully we recognize that that's probably not a good approach to give a human self-efficacy and the ability to navigate their own condition. Um, precise attentiveness to language with no goals of conversation being predetermined. You let the conversation flow. You let the patient lead. Of course, we'll have patients who tend to go off the rails a little bit, and you might have to politely nudge them back on to the task, but you let that story unfold. Peter O'Sullivan, another good example, tell me your story, just allows the patient, and the language is the patient's language. We don't, you know, Im, you know, impose our language on the patient. We try to fit our language and our communication to where the patient's at and not vice versa. Um, we with that, we calibrate our speech to the client's worldview and degree of understanding. So we don't just assume patients know what a meniscus is or, or what their x-ray may mean. We ask them questions. What do you understand about a degenerative disc? What do you understand about arthritic changes in your knee? Um, you know, just so you give this patient's worldview and understanding a chance to be expressed so you can determine, hey, is that something that, based on my thought on that, is it going to be helpful to move them towards, you know, healing, or is it going to be something that might be a barrier where you can then see if you can come together with a discussion that hopefully allows them to make some good decision-making and uh, move them more towards, uh, obviously, more valued goals. But in the end, you're trying to match your decision-making and communication to the client instead of fitting that to fitting your clients to you, which I would definitively say in my career, I was trying to, uh, all the clients, I f the communication was fit to me. It was not fit to them. Narrative-based practice just opens up a whole world of being able to fit yourself to your client, their worldview, their beliefs, their understanding, and then see if you can co-construct a narrative that can move them towards some valued goals where you're not trying to steer or change things. You're just trying to give them uh, a stage to express themselves. And again, I don't think we have to hear too many more stories of chronic pain patients finally feeling listened to, finally feeling, um, you know, heard and understood that, and, and telling us that that was a huge turning point in their healthcare, that probably an important thing for us to be doing in clinical practice. Last slide I wanted to go through, because I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, we get into a little bit more of this when we get into some of our co coursework and things. But I just wanted to get, touch upon a little bit, because I want to respect your guys' time today. But what are the barriers to it? And there's this ingrained belief during our training and, and reinforced in our professional cultures that our encounters are solely about coming to this decision threshold and taking action. 
And it's not to say that that isn't part of it, because again, we need to be able to question and determine red flags and man, you don't belong in a physical therapy clinic. We need to send you back to your primary care physician um, or other different things that might say, hey, you're having the signs and symptoms of, you know, a, a clinical herniated disc with, you know, different things. So again, we're, we can question those things, but it's not solely on that. You know, how is the person coping? What are they thinking? How are they behaving around their condition? What do they feel about it? And, and what are they, how's their narrative changing as this condition has arose in their life and their narrative? Um, again, I apologize if you guys are hearing uh, blowers and weed whackers out there. My apologies. Um, care is that, is, that is led by f management or financial models that appear to carry more authority or objectivity than human values. This is a big, in the discussion that, we had a, a blog post, and I can't remember the therapist re this week on Medium who put it out that how some of the uh, patient care is getting really dictated by, you know, revenue-based models and productivity models and financial models, and we're losing that human value. I would argue that is definitely a problem that we need to be looking at as a profession and posing solutions um, to it, not just complaining about it, um, finding ways. How do we respect the fact that we do have financial, we need to have the financial ability to function as physical therapists. I'm not saying we have to become rich or different things, but we need to be able to feed our families and do the different things that we need to. Um, and granted, our profession doesn't have a ton to complain about here in the U.S., but we do need to make sure we don't lose human values and lose that humanity, which I'd argue has already happened in a lot of cases in healthcare, um, but also make it be a model that can be one that moves forward and is productive for both patient and therapist so they can maintain the ability to help people. Um, this uh, conviction that decisions and actions can only be achieved through that normative approach, um, especially if time's limited. I think oftentimes, you know, given that story, uh, the stage, and not immediately thinking you have to jump and cut people off and go into that normative-based uh, approach and communication style can be helpful. And I, I haven't found that it's been dramatically a time sucker or waster um, and I think the research would support that is if you just give the patient uh, the time I think it was 90 seconds to 120 seconds if I remember right that they can often get out their opening statement and feel like they've you know been able to express themselves a little bit obviously there's more than just that to the patient expressing themselves but um, if you give it a chance and not get this immense rush that you have to get into a treatment decision um, with this normative style, I think you can open up some avenues where a patient feels like, man, he is, and again, the therapeutic alliance, so powerful with patients. And I think that listening and giving that narrative a stage is a powerful way to build that alliance with our patients. Uh, lack of appropriate micro skills to elicit significant factual information through a narrative approach. So the micro skills, I, soft skills, I hate the word just because they are not easy skills. I tell our students in our university that these are skills that are much harder, in my opinion, than a cervical manipulation and a thoracic than a lumbar manipulation. And I think we waste our time getting way too technical with that stuff. I'm not saying you shouldn't be technically proficient in those things, but how much further do you need to get tech, you know, com complex in that part of our craft and miss the human experience of it? And I think, again, that lack of micro skills, because we don't value them, we don't think they're important, yet our patients are sure telling us and the research is sure telling us that it helps to, to have those skills on board. Again, soft skills not being a great term for it. Um, and no uh, previous training on how to reach decisions and actions collaboratively through working with the narrative. So we have Lysanthia Taylor and other folks who are doing narrative-based trainings of therapists. I think Joe Tata actually does some work with it in his trainings and different stuff. we got some great folks that are doing some good stuff with it. But you need to start learning how to communicate based on a narrative. And honestly, I tell students, this doesn't need to be freaking hard. Be a good human being. Show that you care and you value their thoughts and opinions and, and understandings of things. It doesn't need to be something that's completely, you know, off the rails and foreign to you. Honestly, it's, I say, I joke with students, like, we're going to give a certification, which I get frustrated with our zest for alphabets, but we're going to give a GHPT certification, good human physical therapist or good human chiropractor or whoever it may be, because I honestly think that's what allows you to get the narrative is just be a good person who shows caring empathy to your patients. All right, I think I'm off my soapbox at this point, but that's where I think we need to go and prioritize our skills as physical therapists. Again, I am not saying that it is not important to become good, technically proficient in manual therapy, but if, if I'll just say there was a good portion of my career where my, I tunnel vision so much into the technical side of my craft and honing my hands that I missed the human being that those hands were connected to and I would just sit in manual therapy conferences, getting my confirmation bias stroked 
day after day and losing the ability. And, and I honestly think I delayed my growth as a therapist. Not that I'm getting into manual therapy is bad, but just that it limits. There's a limit to it. You can only communicate so much through your hands. You got to have this and these working well and show that you're a good human being in front of patients. I think there's some folks that just do it implicitly. They're skilled at it. Some people, not so much. Oh, God. Thank you, landscapers, for that lovely background music. Um, I apologize for that, guys. But if you found this valuable, I'd love you to smack the like button and love button. Facebook's algorithm makes it like if you don't smack that like or love button, it doesn't get seen by people. So I'd like people in this group um, to be able to see this. I'd also like to see folks out of this group see it that might have some value. So share it, if you don't mind, with other folks. But also throw some questions on there. I'm going to post uh, some links to this book. So if it's not terribly expensive on Amazon um, and a worthwhile purchase. Honestly, it's, a, it's probably one of my favorite books that I've read recently. And I think it's a good way for us to start developing those skills when you don't have a class or something you can take immediately. But uh, keep your ears and eyes peeled on Modern Pain Care too. We'll have some stuff that will be providing uh, a training in this realm as well. Um, and you guys just go out there and be good humans. I hope you have a good rest of your Thursday. Uh, great chatting with you today. Take care.